This is the Critical Conversations podcast, a KPOV special project developed to feature unique perspectives and the courage it takes to go there, challenge mundane thought, and question the norm. Rick, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little about Mountain View. Yeah. And is it a collective? What is Mountain View? And who are you? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show today. I'm Rick Russell, and I'm the pastor at Mountain View Fellowship. Uh, but uh, about this pe- past year, we created a separate nonprofit called Mountain View Community Development, and that's what we're here to talk about. We manage a program called Safe Parking in Redmond, and uh, Safe Parking is uh, it's a program to provide safe, uh, legal parking options for people who live in their vehicles. And uh, as they work towards stability, we provide case management and other services to make that a, a positive experience and a transitional experience. So these are people in vehicles, cars, vans, RVs, who've probably been parking around town, and we're trying to get them um, stabilized, get them connected to services, and then ultimately get them onto a more stable housing environment from there. What about you, Sierra? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for Mountain View Community Development? Yeah, my name is Sierra Hopper. I'm the Safe Parking Program Director. Um, I do the case management and just the directing of the program, so uh, help with the financial piece, the grants, um, but also lead all the case management for all the participants. And how long have you been doing that, Sierra? Since uh, March or May. Yeah, it's been <laughs> time One flies when you're having months, fun. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's been <laughs> since the spring. Yeah. Well, so um, what I'm finding interesting. Um, is that you're focusing on individuals who are houseless right now Mm -hmm. and who are living in their cars, as you say. Um, So how do you set that up? And this is primarily in Redmond, correct? Yeah, there is a safe parking program in Bend as well and uh, with Reach, and they do a great job. But yeah, we focus on Redmond. And yeah, people come to us through any number of ways. Uh, Sierra, do you want to kind of talk about the... Mm -hmm sources that people find us. Yeah. Yeah. So we utilize a system called HMIS. It's the Homeless Management Information System. And uh, a lot of nonprofits in the area utilize this system. We can get referrals through it, but we also save data in it. Um, And so all of the number of nonprofits, Thrive, Neighbor Impact, uh, Reach and Bend, they'll all send us referrals for people who they know that are living in their vehicles. And word spreads from person to person. Our police department is one of our prime uh, referral agencies uh, as they encounter people around town, maybe parked in places that are not not safe for them to be. And so a lot of community partners kind of know us and have our brochures and and pass our, our cards along. And so you say there's a data system. How who who set that up? Oh boy, HMIS has been around for a while and it's broadly used among service providers throughout not just the region, but a state. And I believe it's national as well, though don't quote me on that. Uh, uh, but it's a broad system used by all sorts of service providers in the area. And HMIS? Yeah. What, what does that stand for again? Homeless Management Information System. Okay. Wow. Wow. Hmm. That's great that there's so many ways for people to find you and mm-hmm. and to find that stability. Why is that stability so important in a homeless person's life? Well, I, you know, people, I think it's really a luxury for us to be able to plan long term. Like I have plans, you know, for my kids in college and I'm, plan, I'm thinking, you know, years down the road, if not decades. But when you get into a crisis situation, your ability to think long term really shrinks down to a much shorter period of time. And, and we've got folks who are... are are in some cases just trying to get through the week or mm-hmm. just trying to get through the day. And um, we, we see that all the time. We, we've got folks who um, live in some of the, the areas where they can kind of be left alone. So if we're in Redmond, that's like 17th Street in our industrial. I think in Bend, a lot of people think of like Hunnell and what that looks like or China Hat. In Redmond, it's a little, a little bit different. But, you know, we've got folks there who um, who who are afraid to leave their site. They're afraid to leave their vehicle for fear of what will happen if they do. Something could, someone could break in, um, uh, they could be sighted. And so we've got folks who, you know, they find it difficult to plan to, for a medical appointment or for a job interview or for things like that, because they're so nervous about leaving where they are. And so really, if we can get people to a safe and stable place, they can begin to think longer term, plan toward housing. Uh, we can help folks with, uh, you know, accessing documents like driver's license. You could probably speak, Sierra, to other services that we connect people to. 
Yeah. Um, so we can help get driver's license. We can help with any of those basic things like uh, write a resume. Um, really as as simple as it gets to as complicated as it gets, we can help people with. So with finances, help them get a job, um, connect them with other resources that will help them get on all the um, low-income housing lists. That's one of the first things we do, um, regardless of your income and regardless of your situation. Um, we can help people connect with a disability lawyer if they need to get um, started with disability, Social Security, that kind of stuff. Wow, that is so many great things. And I could tell, like, being homeless, you already have such limited possessions, so you want to be able to keep those safe and have a safe place mm -hmm. for those. Mm -hmm. Do you often find resistance from businesses um, to get involved in the program or to provide parking spaces? Well, well, I would say that finding new locations to operate safe parking is certainly the bottleneck for us and the, and the biggest challenge. Um, we operate currently at the church, we operate at the VFW, and here in just another couple weeks we'll have our third site at uh, a piece of property owned by the county on the east side of town. Uh, it's just a vacant piece of property. Uh, we've got other partners uh, kind of in the works right now, uh, other organizations, churches taking a look at this. But yeah, I think the hesitancy is, uh, I, I remember this conversation with my own church board when we started this you know, a year ago, and it was you know, we're going to invite what into our property? Is it going to be garbage? Is it going to be safe? Is it going to be drug use? Is it going to be, what's it going to look like? What will the neighbors say? All those questions. And, you know, once we sort through those, um, it, we've been operating this now on our location for over a year. And it turns out we have no real issues. Uh, we provide porta potties, we provide garbage service for folks. Um, it's just a very quietly operating program. We've had no complaints from neighbors. Um, but that is the concern that that other property owners, uh, churches, service organizations, uh, businesses have is that fear of, oh, what am I going to invite to my my property? And uh, I, I try to tell people it's actually a it's actually a win. It actually turns out to be a really positive thing for for the host site. Uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, one of the first experiences we had with safe parking at our property was uh, I came to meet a new participant in the program. We'd been doing it for a few weeks. And I met him one night, and uh, he introduced himself. And I said, well, I'm, I'm Rick, and I'm the pastor here. And he said, oh, well, pastor, I wanted to let you know that last night there were some teenagers here in the parking lot doing, doing donuts in your parking lot. And I told them, I don't think you guys should be here anymore. And I was like, all right, we got some nighttime security out here. I, didn't even, I wasn't even asking for this. And, you know, as a property owner, we used to find at our vacant parking lot, I'd come in for work, we'd find beer bottles and, and marijuana paraphernalia wow. and clothing items. And um, as I like to tell people, at late at night, people do unholy things in church parking lots. And that all stopped <laughs> when we started doing safe parking because there's just the presence of people there. And so this sounds counterintuitive, and I don't know if people believe me, but safe parking will make your church, your business, your organization, your location safer for having hosted it than if you didn't host it. And that's been our experience for, for over a year now. And sounds like it really brings the community together. I was really interested in the process. Does somebody get in touch with you to live at your place? How do you keep from expanding and expanding and expanding? Because my observations when I am near Hunnell especially is that it just keeps growing and yet there's not a resource there. And I'm hearing you tell me there are so many resources. So I'm going to add a little addendum to my question. Do you have somebody on site that lives there or you mentioned earlier that you have your security with some of the individuals who live there. So tell us about the process and how you keep it from growing, you know, uncontrolled. Sure. Yeah. I think that's very important. And um, for us, it's, it's really crucial to operate small sites. So we don't have 20 or 30 RVs or vehicles in one spot. We do small pockets, um, one, two, three, four, five vehicles in a location. And the city code actually caps it at six. Bend is the same way. And so we can't, we can't go beyond that. But we, we like that small uh, sense. Um, pe people often say, well, you know, if, if you have one or two vehicles there, what's to keep 15 other people in RVs from just showing up all of a sudden? And we have found that just to not be the case. We've been operating now for, for uh, over a year, and we just haven't seen that. Uh, at one time, we've had someone who was coming in. We were learning from our other participants who were there. They're very 
um, in a kind of a healthy way, protective of the space. And we hear from them if there's funny stuff going on in the property. And we began to hear from one of our participants, hey, late at night, there's a vehicle pulling in and parking here. And then they're gone first thing in the morning. And it was late at night and early in the morning, so we weren't seeing them. And so we we reached out to our partners at the Redmond Police Department and said, hey, we've got a vehicle. Here's the description. They're coming in late at night. They went by one night, found the gentleman, gave him one of our cards, and we later connected with him and actually got him into the program. He was working all day. He had been staying at the um, Fred Myers parking lot and a few other parking lots. And I, we finally connected with him. And I said, so tell me the story. What's the deal? Why are you you're here in your car? And he said, I, I just need a place to park where I, this was in the, in August. This was like when it was really hot out. He said, I just need a place to park where I can keep my window rolled down because he's sleeping. And he said, I just don't feel safe at Fred Myers. People will come up to me late at night. I don't know who they are. That's a scary um, environment, if you could imagine that. And so it, it was really heartbreaking. But he's a great guy. He, we got him into our program. And, and so that was you know, one case where we saw someone showing up uninvited. But we were able to get them into the, into the program. He's been great. He's still with us. And, and I think he's got a good, good future still working. Most of our participants, at, I'd say at least half are working. And, and um, but just cannot afford. But we just don't see that fear realized of um, uh, uninvited RVs showing up. We have great relationships with the police department. Uh, we're currently working with City Hall right now on a code that would actually create a no camping zone around safe parking sites. And so if, if it ever became a, a real problem, there would be another enforcement tool to prevent that ha from happening. And, and really for a, a tool for us to say to businesses, churches, hey, if you say yes to hosting safe parking, um, you can create a controlled environment. Whereas if you say no to safe parking, uh, you'll actually have less tools uh, for managing your property. And so uh, it, it, we just haven't seen it, but I know that fear is, is out there. Yeah, I learned recently talking to the Jericho Road of Redmond that 40% of homeless people are actually working. And a lot of people don't really think about that because of all the stigmas related to um, homeless. And we were talking about the not in my backyard. So could you talk about maybe people's opinions of wanting to help the homeless, but not really, or, or the stigmas that come with, with the homeless? Yeah, I could speak a little bit to the stigmas. Uh, I would say a lot of people tend to think that with homeless comes drugs and, um, you know, dirtiness. And I know Rick was kind of explaining that earlier that we don't see that in our program really at all. We haven't experienced it. Um, and I know one big reason is because we do provide, you know, trash services, porta potties. People aren't needing to use their bathrooms in their RVs. If they're living in a car, they have a way to go to the bathroom at all of our sites. Um, and, and so we haven't really seen any of that. But I do know that's a fear uh, of the neighbors that we've worked with um, and that kind of nimbyism where they love the program. They just they just don't want it right here. So. Yeah, I recently read an OPB article that did a survey last January, and they found that 1,300 people on a given night are homeless in Central Oregon. Do you think the community is aware of how dire or how large that number is? I don't think so. I think we see the folks, you know, flying a sign, to use that phrase, you know, people holding up a sign saying, I, I'm homeless. Uh, we see them at you know, near shopping centers and so on. But I, I just don't know, unless you've driven out to where some of these areas are, I just don't know that you would, you would uh, comprehend how many folks are living there. You, you know, I'm more familiar with uh, Redmond because that's where I live, but Redmond is uniquely laid out. Um, if, you, if you think of the city, it kind of has three stripes, we'll say. So on the west side, you've got residential. Uh, in the center, you've got commercial. You know, you've got all your Highway 97 businesses and so on. And then on the west side, you've got the airport, uh, excuse me, on the east side, you've got the airport and the industrial area. And so most, uh, we have a lot of folks living in the industrial area because if you are unhoused, if you're in the residential area, you're going to get a lot of folks calling the police concerned. Why are you there? What's going on? Commercial is very similar. Uh, but in that industrial area, there are a lot of folks um, living out there. And, and unless you're one of the businesses out there, you, you probably don't know uh, how, many, how many people are living in their vehicles or in tents uh, in that part of town. Recently, I heard the airport is planning on doing a cleanup of the homeless camps. Could you talk about how that would affect um, homeless people? 
Yeah, it's one of the challenges of the layout, again, the layout of our town, where you've got industrial and airport, commercial in the middle, and residential on the west side. Well, if you have the airport in this industrial area, you also have to create a safety zone around that area because you've got, obviously, air planes taking off and landing and passengers. And and to complicate it further, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, really, really doesn't want people living near the airport for safety concerns. And so they're kind of all over the airport right now. Hey, you've got people too close uh, to the airport. There's, there's one area in particular that I think probably has about a dozen um, f- family units living directly within a path of, of uh, a runway approach. And so they call it the RPZ, R- Runway Protection Zone. Mm. And so there are some efforts right now, coordinated effort with the city, with the airport, with uh, service providers to uh, try to relocate those folks. Where will they go or be relocated to? What will happen to them? Yeah, isn't that the question? Yeah. Um, you know, to complicate it further, there's another area where a lot of people are camped camped out on near uh, 17th Street. I keep referring to Antler in that area in the Northwest Industrial Area. The the other thing complicating this right now is that there's a proposed land swap between the state and the county in order to provide uh, expand the county fairgrounds, and so th- they're trying to get folks, you know, 30 to 50 different um, uh, campsites in that area. And so, in some ways, it does feel like whack-a-mole. If we move folks over here, we got to make sure they can't go over to this other property because we're getting ready to clear folks from that property. And this is why it's crucial. We can't just move people around. Um, we really do have to get more service providers in, more case management. We need to know people by their name. We need to know their story. And we need to know what opportunities exist for them. Um, uh, unfortunately, if we if we rush this, I think what happens is we we uh, we just push people further out, and three years from now we'll be having another sweep and talking about where they're going to go from here. Could you tell us where people can reach you or find out more about your program? Yeah, if people are interested in registering to be a participant, they can go to mvcdredmond.org, um, and there's a link there to uh, register. It's been wonderful having both of you on the show, and I really know that Mountain View Community Development is looking for a solution rather than just relocating people around the community. And it sounds like with this, these planned efforts, with the investment of the community, nonprofits, businesses, and government, as well as the police, that it's a partnership that can be very successful. Will you give the website one more time? Yeah, it's mvcdredmond.org. And Rick, you have something to say real uh, quickly. Just thank you for the opportunity to, to share about this kind of resource. It's, it's valuable and crucial for our community, our region right now. You've been listening to a KPOV Critical Conversation. To hear more engaging interviews on important topics, please visit kpov.org slash critical conversations.